Hey folks, welcome to this episode of the Application Security Podcast. This is Chris Romeo. I'm the CEO of Security Journey and co-host of the podcast. I'm joined also by Robert Hurlbut. Hey, Robert. Hey, Chris. Yeah, Robert Hurlbut, uh, Threat Modeling Architect. Good to be here. Uh, it's a new year, actually, for us. It is. This is the first recording of 2022. And with that, we're excited to be talking about something that a lot of people are going to continue to be thinking about and considering in this new year, and that's blockchain. So I have to tell a quick origin story for this conversation. Normally, we jump right into our guest's origin story, but um, our guest today is Ken Toller. And this conversation actually began at, all pla- of all places, the last con 2021 speaker dinner in... Austin, Texas. I think I was in Austin, Texas. I don't know. It was a place in Texas. And Ken and I happened to start chatting over the dinner, talking about blockchain and AppSec and the intersections. And it was such a fascinating conversation that I said, hey, we got to get Ken on the podcast to tell some of these stories and talk about these things for our audience. So Ken, let's jump right in with your security origin story. Our audience wants to know, how did you get into this crazy world of AppSec? (laughs) Yeah, I mean... I, you know, I came to AppSec from, um, from help desk, actually. I mean, I, I was working at a a company that maybe some of, uh, some of the younger folks in the audience may not even know anymore, but living social. Um, I was a, I was basically a music major that was paying for school with IT jobs. And, uh, eventually I, uh, was doing an antivirus deployment and worked really closely with the security team. And we were all working pretty closely together. And I made the switch to InfoSec and had this grand vision of, you know, hackers and breaking things and all that, like like most of us do. It's like when you get into software development, you want to go make games. When you get into security, you usually want to like break stuff or hack into things. Um, and so when I left there, I did some odd jobs consulting at InfoSec and got a really amazing opportunity to work with uh, some senior folks at like a small AppSec security firm. I uh, was growing with them and did a bunch of work for government and breaking into web apps and all that. And I think, you know, the rest is history. I've just been learning and picking up things as I've been going. And, you know, there's every year it's something new and just keeping up with it. And a lot of it is just diving in, reading, researching. And I've been doing that since day one, I think, uh, ever since I made that switch and I haven't looked back since. How did you get into blockchain specifically then? Because... I haven't seen blockchain and AppSec. I haven't seen a lot of intersection of these two topics yet. And so I'm just curious, like, what's the what's the point where you realize blockchain's a thing and start to consider the security and ultimately AppSec, how they fit together? Well, it came through engagements just in consulting. um, You know, we were were running an application security services team. And we had a, a lot of requests come in. I mean, just the intersection of uh, crypto and, and AppSec. And we were performing a lot of the same services for these code reviews for things like smart contract audits. And the, the techniques, the, the, the ways that we approached, um, you know, the methodology of assessing source code really intersected well. And it just kind of happened organically within the organization as we started to take on more and more of these engagements. And it's become its own service. And it's another rabbit hole that, you know, we just dove into, but it's all code. So it really, it fit really well together there, but it was uh, again on the job, um, just kind of got into it. I've, I've been investing in cryptocurrency here and there, but um, it hasn't really, you know, that was, that was the main thing was just a work associated thing. So it's a term that we heard. I mean, uh, certainly in the last few years, uh, blockchain and cryptocurrency and so forth. But what is blockchain? Could you define that for us? Sure. I mean, blockchain is, I mean, what it's, it's what, a, what a loaded question, right? <laughs> I mean, it's kind of like asking someone what's a pen test or right. what's DevSecOps, but I'll, I'll do my best. I mean, at, it, at its core, blockchain is an immutable ledger. It's a list of records, a list of transactions um, that we are. And if you talk to some software developers, they're like, what's the big deal about this ledger? We've been doing this forever. Um, but we're trying to find a way to make something that's efficient, fair, real time, functional, reliable, a secure mechanism to ensure that all the transactions that you're talking about um, are genuine. And because we have this big decentralized mechanism, we're looking for a way to make sure that all of these participants that are working inside of this chain are are agreeing on the status of this ledger. So at, at its core, it is a, an, an immutable ledger. That's what the, the goal of blockchain is. But I think when we talk about blockchain and blockchain security, just like when we talk about pen tests and 
DevSecOps, it, it kind of inherently bundles all these things and industries and markets and technologies like uh, decentralized finance and cryptocurrency and DAOs and supply chains and NFTs. And so it all sort of becomes part of what people think about when they talk about blockchain. And now thanks to some of the larger corporations, we're now, now it's part of metaverse. I mean, there's all these th things that we think about when we think about blockchain. But at the end of the day, it's an immutable ledger of transactions, immutable being it's unchangeable. Once it's, once a, a transaction is written and accepted on the blockchain, it's there forever. And you think about something that's, that's, oh, seems oh so simple, but yet can have so many different use cases. And as we start to unpack this, so many different potential areas of, of challenge in the future, it's, this, this is one of those areas that it's kind of, it, it's, it's an interesting time to watch on Twitter, all the conversations <laughs> yeah. in regards to blockchain, because there are some people that hate this. They, they hate the whole idea of, I think it's really cryptocurrency is, is what's driving their hatred. And this whole idea of, you know, Web3 being this, this new generation of companies and new technologies that are going to do things using the blockchain as the kind of backbone, you know, versus Web2, where companies like social networks and things, these companies own all the data, they get rich off all of the content and stuff that you post and web three being this idea where, you know, you, you're in charge of your own data because you have some, some further ability to, to own it, control who can access it and whatnot. And so I just find it funny that there are some people that just have such a hatred. They're like, this isn't even a thing. It's just, it's just, you know, a bunch of made up stuff for people to try to rip other people off. And I don't feel like they've gone and really understood the essence of, of, of what can happen here with this, this powerful of a technology. So, Let's um, let's see, Ken. Can you tie together blockchain, cloud, and application security, and draw some connections for us there? Because most of our listeners are going to be very familiar with AppSec. They're going to be very familiar with cloud, and blockchain is going to be the new thing. It's going to be the one thing on this list that doesn't fit. And so, how do we? What's the intersection between blockchain, cloud, and AppSec? Sure. So, I think the the best way to look at this is to Think about blockchain exactly as you described it, which is a technology as a tool, as a platform to build interesting things on in the same way that, you know, I, I always say like a decade ago, but probably like five or six years ago, we talked about during cloud migrations, it was cloud as a tool for you to move your workloads. I, I like to think of blockchain in, in a similar way because we're, we're talking about a lot of the same when we're coming up with ideas, we're looking at ways to use the technology to, to make it better or easier for humans to interact or safer or more secure. And I think security is constantly bundled into blockchain and it, it's, only, it's almost made it this inaccessible idea because uh, everyone thinks of it as something that if they don't understand the, the, the tech of it or they don't understand it in depth, that they can't even start to approach like, well, addressing security on it or thinking about it in that way. But if you look at a lot of the organizations like these, uh, where you buy your cryptocurrency or um, some of the projects that you're seeing, I mean, I've seen thing, everything from, you know, decentralized exchanges to dating applications being developed on the blockchain, but there's still applications. And one of the common misconceptions is that if something goes onto the blockchain, that it's inherently secure because it's built on the blockchain. And I think what commonly sort of gets maybe not swept under the rug, but avoided is that there are centralized components to a lot of these, uh, these products and these projects, whether that's internal applications and APIs, or whether it's um, someone creating maybe a centralized front end. You mentioned Web3. There are client components to this. So there are, there are standard applications built on um, these uh, SDKs that are that run in the browser and interact with the chain directly. Th that is all application security and, and, it, and, the, and weaknesses manifest in the same way that we see them in every other um, JavaScript application or you know React application or things like that. Those are going to also manifest inside of these, these client-side applications. Mm -hmm. There's also cloud infrastructure that goes into this. There are folks that are running uh, validators or mining rigs inside of clouds. Um, organizations hold these in order to s sort of have some com some heavy uh, weight inside of the the market, whether they're doing proof of stake or something along those lines. Like they have some sort of infrastructure that they need to protect. 
And a lot of these um, applications that we're talking about, you know, when you look at your NFT marketplaces, some of them you can connect with just a, a wallet and we have all of the decentralization, but that's just a browser plugin. You know, there's an application security component there. Um, and some of them, you actually have to sign up as a user with your email address and, and whatever. So that anonymous um, assumption that everything that you're doing is with a wallet is not is not correct in every implementation of using a blockchain or using a you know one of these public blockchains because those users have to be stored somewhere so just because a blockchain is a part of the tech stack doesn't mean that it's all of the tech stack and yeah. so there are still areas where um, applications are being used apis are being used third-party integrations are being used cloud infrastructure is being used all of your containerization all the things that we typically think of it's just now that there's this extra technology component that we need to consider when we're looking at the entire threat model. That's helpful because I hadn't really thought of it. I guess I had this kind of maybe naive view of blockchain related applications and things being just things that are like, you know, smart contracts or smart or, or the distributed applications, right? It's another thing, dApps. And they get written to, they have some component on the Ethereum blockchain where the application itself can ride on that. And so I was kind of thinking maybe naively that you know, the, the blockchain related applications are things that are just on the chain, but it sounds like what you're saying is there's just a lot of other, there's a lot of other, what we'll call classic web infrastructure, cloud infrastructure, um, other types of applications and browser plugins and, and lots of different pieces that are, the blockchain is really just acting like a database in that component with all these other components that we need to worry about. Yeah, there's there's a bunch of angry faces happening right now calling the blockchain a database. I can I can hear it in my I can hear it in you my ears. See it in your mind. <laughs> yeah, but it to a degree, yes, you can store data on the on the blockchain. But it it I think the the way that I like to look at it is when we started to move into um, uh, app like. Um, modular applications and working with multiple APIs and, and and moving in that direction away from and into microservices away from monolithic applications. Um, we had this, we have a lot of these technologies that have come into play that we don't really think about as much anymore, like app to app authorization and all of these different security components that allowed us to securely and safely talk between these APIs that served a specific function. I think we're still kind of figuring that out to a degree. And so when you talk about smart contracts, smart contracts, some of them are very large, some of them are very small, but usually you're interacting with them by um, providing an instruction or a transaction on the chain. That smart contract takes it, does something with the logic, it interacts with other smart contracts. So it's very much like a, it's similar to a microservices architecture, but how that, how that instruction gets there can come from a variety of different areas. Um, whether that's from one of these client side applications with direct user input, or it can come from like an organization wants to, to send this automatically or use an API. So these all interact and have this interplay together. And I think that we need to treat it in a very similar way because the application itself doesn't solely exist, um, on the, on the chain. It's just one component of it exists on the chain. And so you'll see a lot of this happen. Like we had um, some of the larger uh, attacks and weaknesses and, and things were around, uh, you know, cross contract weaknesses or authorization or the wrong, you know, it didn't check that the correct owner was allowed to run a particular function within that contract. These are all authorization vulnerabilities and weaknesses that happen that we would, we would consider very similar to um, an unprotected or unauthorized API, right? If it was just a public API, we had no authorization structure, like we'd have a very similar attack. It's just that now we can see it all happen on the chain. Yeah, that's, that's, that's very helpful. And before we transition into thinking about different failures, I want to get your take on one other thing. So when I think about blockchain and AppSec, cryptography is a big part of blockchain. Like cryptography provides the foundational strength that allows blockchain to be provable and to go through the, the operations there. Now, as somebody, you know, you're somebody who's, who's thought about this a lot more and has a lot more, a lot of experience in this. Do you consider cryptography to be part of application security in regards to blockchain? 
or do you just are you, have we reached a point where we're just like oh the crypto's all good it's been checked by lots of cryptographers and everybody believes it's good and and there is no security component of crypto when we think about appsec and blockchain um i don't think so i think that there are still cryptographic weaknesses i because there are so there are a couple of the way that we approach this like from the on the consulting side is you know i am i'm not a cryptographer by trade you know i've got um some like some crypto chops but i don't spend a lot of my time doing cryptographic assessments and you know we have a team that does cryptographic assessments uh that are looking at new and, and novel cryptography and that's part of you know those are part of the services that we offer and I, you know i come out of those conversations always feeling stupid when i'm talking to these these folks right but um it, there are new chains being developed all the time. Like we talk about Ethereum and we talk about Bitcoin and we talk about these main blockchains, but there are still new and novel chains being developed that need new and novel crypto or are trying to uh, implement a particular type of crypto in a different chain or in a different language. And so I think that there's still um, a security evaluation that needs to happen for those. Um, I also think that we have the same issues with cryptography in writing contracts, right? The correct implementation of cryptography and the correct implementation of the libraries that are known and, and evaluated by these professionals. But I don't think that we're at the point where we can just um, just call it good. And in fact, um, one I read a Reddit post uh, recently that was like, um, and I know already I'm I'm like get it, you know, just like going to the wrong resources to find information. But I read this Reddit post and it essentially was like, you know, security on this particular chain uh, is, you know, can think about it as stupid because it's, you know, one of the best chains and da, 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 da. And there's still this mindset of exactly what you said, which is, you know, the crypto is strong. Like the whole point of blockchain is to be secure. And so we don't have to worry about it. Just build the application. And, and there are still people in the blockchain community that believe that if if something happens to you, it's the user's fault, right? Mm -hmm. That every, the chain is secure. So whatever you did, you lost, you, you didn't handle your wallet correctly, or you know they wrote a bad smart contract, but if they had written it correctly, then it would have been fine. But I think that there is part of our issue in blockchain in the community is this assumption of security because it's blockchain. And that's just not, that's just not the case. I think it, it, we still have to continue to be um, mindful of things that are changing. Yeah, to draw a parallel from my AppSec history and experience, and, and you guys, will, this will probably resonate with both of you as well. There was a period in time, I want to say, I'm going back 10 years, where people, developers would say, you know, you'd say, well, you know, how's the, the security of your application? Oh, it's great. We have TLS. We implemented TLS. Like, like, yes, that's a great thing, but all you've done is encrypted the channel that the attacker can use to send a SQL injection inbound to your application. So we had this false sense of security that was brought upon by using strong cryptography. Like it was a good thing what they were doing, but they had this idea of like, I don't need to worry about SQL injection. I got TLS. Well, no, that's, that's, that's a, you're protecting the tunnel not the things that go through the tunnel. It sounds like there might be a, a similar challenge right now in the blockchain world where people are like, of course the chain's good. It's 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 cryptographically strong. Exactly. You're you're exactly right. And to to sort of add on to that point, the the idea that these client side applications don't need to be considered in 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 security evaluations. Like many of the security audits that are requested are for smart contracts and uh, there are organizations that ignore their client side completely because they believe that, well, it's, you know, that's for the user. Like we don't have any servers hosting this or whatever. So th there's no responsibility for us on the client side application. It's just interacting with the blockchain. So we just want to cover the, um, the, the smart contract. And that's like going into an application and only looking at the controllers. You know, it's like, there's, there's this whole other side of it. And, and so then you have to have the conversation with that organization that is, well, do you, do you care if your user you know, is affected by a malicious user outside of your control? And do you want to protect them against that? Like, does that have an impact on your brand at all? Like, you know, what does that look like for you? Um, and I think that that is a conversation we're going to continually have as these, as these applications become more and more complex. It's almost a, a dirty 
word to talk about centralization in the blockchain community, but um, I think it's it's an important conversation to have because there are some problems that are being solved with centralization in the decentralized space. And it really depends on how an organization or project or person wants to use this technology. Uh, so if you're thinking about the crypto space and specific things like decentralized exchanges, sure, but there's still a market for centralized exchanges like your your Coinbase's of the world that that are going to provide a centralized place for you to go and use your credit card. Well, if you're using your credit card, I mean, you know that's not going to the blockchain. You know that has to go to some payment processor elsewhere, and so there is a centralized component to that. Yeah, you thought I was going to get in trouble for saying the blockchain's a database. You just suggested in a world of decentralization that security <laughs> might lead us down a centralized path. So yeah, um, I know yeah, I'm, people... I'm starting people's New Year's off with a lot of like red faces and anger. I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, they can decide who they want to go after first, whether it's me, yeah. the blockchain is database, or you, the centralized front man for decentralization. There you go. <laughs> well, as uh, Chris mentioned a moment ago about failures, and I think maybe you've alluded to some, some potential, but what are some of the common architectural failures that you've seen? I, I think that, I think we sort of discussed them, but just to summarize, it's it's kind of like... Um, I think it's the the ignoring of these centralized components. I I I think the when you're we're looking when we're doing an architecture review, I think there's a a very large percentage of folks that come to ask about security that focus solely on smart contracts and the blockchain, which is important, and ignore the rest of their infrastructure or don't have an idea that you know um, many of these projects exist open source. It's super, I mean, I, I love where the community is in terms of transparency of their code, um, transparency of their security audits, and um, and everything that goes into um, trying to be transparent with the, the folks that are using your, your product and your platform. But there are organizations that have uh, these, you know, cloud infrastructures and, and just don't worry about them. Um, and so I think that as far as the the failures there, it's ignoring the security in your in the rest of your product uh, is is like the is the biggest failure. So your user management, your two FA, your input validation, your um, trust of the user, the trust of wallets, um, even the trust of the contributors to your project. Um, you know, just watching as uh, you know these open source projects accept commits and um, that you know they get pulled in and it's thousands or hundreds of thousands of uh, people committing code, university students, professionals, non-professionals, folks that have just learned this language are, are making contributions, which is great, uh, but offers the same problems that we have with open source. Um, and so, it, you know, how, how much backing does the project have? Um, you know, how, how much is security looked at this? Who is looking at it? All those things are are weighing in just like what weighs in with open source but now you know you have um something that's handling uh money currency uh and that now that is like open source i mean it just it, it has a, a bunch of potential problems which i think is why larger organizations with with uh, sort of bigger wallets and bigger ideas tend to have some centralized component of it because they want to control a piece of this. So I want to get into what kinds of surprising mistakes you've seen in blockchain security. But first, as I'm, I'm thinking about everything that you've said so far and about the fact that there's organizations who are doing things in the blockchain space, who's responsible for blockchain security inside the average organization? Is there a title of blockchain security engineer? that you've seen or, or who's doing, who's responsible? Yeah, definitely. There are there. So I think you have to look at how big some of these, I mean, we say organization, but um, projects, how big these projects are, because when just be, what I think the really powerful thing and the great thing that blockchain is offering and the cryptocurrency market is offering is like, if you have an idea, you can create that idea or that application you can deploy it yourself on the blockchain and you can be handling and and making money off of that idea very quickly based on just the the economics of the the blockchain that you're working in 
And some of these organizations are one to two people, yeah. right? That come in and do this. So in those organizations, no, you're not going to have a blockchain security engineer, but you might have some folks that are interested in helping you with your security, or you might be able to um, send crypto to someone to do a security audit from you know your your favorite firm, and you can go onto GitHub and look at a bunch of public you know security reports that that show you um, you know how good these folks are, or what whether they're looking for you know what your um, what you're interested in and you have conferences just like we have for, you know, security where you can go and meet these, these folks that are doing these security audits. Uh, but there are, there's definitely room for those people. I think it's just that, um, finding those people is really hard because it's so new. Um, and there are just, uh, there's a, there's a huge, um, learning curve to being able to conduct an audit in this space because of lack of tools, lack of expertise, lack of knowledge. Um, lack of finance knowledge, right? Just um, having that that under your belt. Yeah, but, definitely a different yeah. set of skills than our classic, you know, sec- people that take a follow a path to a security engineer. You know, I think blockchain security engineer, you got to have a certain amount of grip- crypto knowledge, meaning when I say crypto, I don't mean crypto coin, I mean crypto cryptography, you know, you got to have that foundational understanding for how things are working under the hood. It's the only way you can know if they're working correctly is if you know how they're supposed to work. And then you've got, you know, components, like we said earlier, of cloud and AppSec. And it's, it's really a, uh, it's, it's got to be a brand new area, but a lot of, a lot of opportunity for people to, to be successful there. So surprising mistakes. So what, what surprising mistakes have you seen in, in blockchain security? Um, I think uh, repetitive mistakes. Um, I think, you know, one of the interesting things is that, you have, um, especially in more well-known, well-known chains, um, you have things that already that have been looked at and reviewed and exist, and they have these best practices, but they continue to to sort of manifest in other ways because the same things that we have uh, in application security, your stack overflows and copy pastas and everything. So that's that's super surprising. I think um, the other surprise, which I I, I mentioned earlier, is that we are repeating history again and again and again with um, just like the the trust and 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 all of that um, being um, seeing the the same sort of pattern that we saw with uh, microservices security, mobile security manifest in blockchain security in this. Uh, I think I keep harping on it, but just the the ignorance of or not ignorance, but ignoring of um, sort of the other components of an application just being too laser focused in, in one particular area. Um, I would say that that is the biggest thing I would, I would want to take away as terms of common mistakes that I'm seeing is just like, uh, take a step back from the project and look at the bigger picture. Um, and, and that is like what manifests, I think from like the threat models that we do or the architecture reviews that we do. Can you, um, can you pen test a blockchain? Um, yes, yes, you can. I think um, it depends on what your definition of um, a pen test is. Mm-hmm. Just like we were talking about before, it's. Um, I, I like to look. So when you ask somebody like, "Hey, we want a pen test," I mean, I, you have probably seen this before. Some some folks sort of look at a pen test as like a like a web application assessment or a dynamic assessment. Some of them will look at it as like an adversarial simulation. Right. Um, some of them will look at it as like an audit or, you know, they think of the final report that they're going to get every year or it's required. So they just ask for a pen test because that's what they know. And so some folks will say you can't pen test a blockchain, but I, I am of the, I'm of the opinion that you can pen test a blockchain. And the way that I answer that is I think that anything that you can attack as a quote unquote hacker or attacker, you can pen test. And so what I think we don't have right now that's consistent are the tools that we have to conduct other pen tests. So a lot of the pen testing that we do, if we think of pen testing, the way that I think of it is like an adversarial simulation. Um, You're looking at it as an attacker. Um, You have to write your own clients and write your own uh, way of interacting with the chain and tamper with your own data because there is no burp suite or, or metasploit or any of this that you can use these tools. So you're, you're doing a lot of this manually. So there's just a, a general lack of tooling. Now I will say that when 
um, when we get a request for a pen test, often what we're trying to do is sort of set the set the terminology for security within blockchain conversations because we are saying, well, do you want us to do a source code review, or are you looking for a smart contract audit, or what is the what is the actual thing that you are wanting to to get out of this? And a lot of folks in the in the industry or in the uh, blockchain communities just don't know what they want. They see that they know that they're their users, the people um, that are using their product or their project want some security assurance, and they don't necessarily know how to give that to them because it's still an industry that we're figuring out in terms of what folks want. And usually that's very different. So you can pen test it. I think um, the method of doing that is just not 100% clear to everyone. Um, and what, what folks define as a pen test is also not 100% clear, but you, you certainly can. Um, especially if you're looking at it from the project level. Uh, from the blockchain, if you're talking about like just the chain itself, um, I think that you could still do that too. I mean, you're, you're looking at, um, in that case, you might be operating on the, you know, the sort of the consensus layer or networking layer and trying to tamper with that as an attacker. Or maybe you're standing up a, you know, a malicious miner or you're trying to control transactions that happen on the chain. Yeah, that would be pen testing a blockchain, in my opinion. So I want to talk about smart contracts and secure coding, how these things fit together. Um, when I first heard the term smart contracts a few years ago, like I didn't, I didn't really grasp exactly what the power of, of, of a smart contract is. I have this idea of like, I don't know, a real estate transaction being done digitally. Like that was what I thought a smart contract was. I, I, I just, I didn't realize that a smart contract would be something you could have code associated with that could be run multiple times over and over again. So when get, give us a definition of a smart contract before we start, before we get into even secure coding and smart contracts, like set the stage for us. When, when you hear smart contract, like what's the, or someone says, Hey, Ken, what's a smart contract? What's your definition? Um, I, I'm going to go completely off book here and say that I look at smart contracts as um, something that you put input into and generate output from. That's, that's, that's like how I try to look at it because the capabilities of languages in smart contracts on whatever chain you're talking about seems to change pretty frequently. And now we have like these very powerful languages like Solidity, where you can do almost anything in a smart contract that you'd be able to do logically in any other, you know, high level language like Python or, or whatever else. So if you can, if you think of it as like, if I were to write a, uh, you know, from the application side, if I were to write a function and I'm taking input into that function as parameters, anything that you can do in that function, you could probably do in a smart contract. Uh, now the difference is you're going to have to pay for that compute power. And, and one of the things that we look at, you know, it's the operations that happen on the chain. So that's, I don't know if that helps. I'm trying to like sort of step outside of the contract word and think of it more as, um, as logic that's executing in a shared compute environment. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a, that's a good definition that takes away from contract is such a loaded term. And that's what, right. that what I was hung up on for a number of years until I, you know, went on this recent trip into blockchain and all the things that are part of it. But um, so let's talk secure coding. Now you mentioned solidity. Um, what, you know, is secure coding a thing for smart contracts? Absolutely. Absolutely. 100%. It, it's just really difficult to find guidance for secure coding in these ecosystems because it means a bunch of different things. I think when you when you look at um, secure coding now, you have great resources from OWASP and you have books and you've got all ways of like how to code securely and common attacks and things to avoid in the top 10, all these kinds of things. But with the exception of Solidity, you know, Solidity has, um, there are some projects out there that talk about common weaknesses in Solidity and things of that nature. Um, but most of the most of the other sort of low level languages that these things are written in, like Rust, um, you know, they, when people think of secure coding in, in those, it usually means they're 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 still thinking on the language level and not necessarily on the smart contract development level. And so the business logic considerations that you make are uh, are changing. And I think what's becoming more, or what I'm realizing more and more, is just the importance of 
threat modeling in these exercises because you really have to think through the business logic of what this smart contract is trying to do, what inputs and outputs are going into this function that you're that you're executing. Because most of the attacks that people are going to care about are not going to be, I mean, they're definitely going to be your underflows and overflows and things of that nature that are these low level sort of weaknesses, all the, the same things that we um, talk about, like race conditions or, or these sort of what I call low level um, language specific sort of um, weaknesses, uh, that, that business logic stuff are things that you have to think through. And most of them are, are taking advantage of the financial logic or the math that happens um, within that function that you're going to have to think through. And I think in order to like be a great security uh, auditor of a smart contract at that level, you really have to understand the finance side of things as well. Uh, the fraud, the, um, the, the sort of um, research into that and how the money moves and what the math looks like. When we have a smart contract that is written onto a blockchain, is that, can I just go download it and read that? Like, is that then, is that code then available to anybody or does it get compiled into some way that it's like Java byte code and I can try to decompile it, but I can't see all the variable names? Like, or is it just flat out once it's there, it's there and anybody can read it and search for vulnerabilities? So it, it is compiled uh, in, in most cases, but it really depends on the, on the chain that you're using. So in the case of Ethereum, you know, it is compiled, like you were talking about, you can see it on the chain and, and you know, there, when you're looking at the ether scan, you know, you're looking at sort of the decompiled um, or the, 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 the decompiled contract, but you don't really have a way to say, yes, this is a hundred percent what was uh, deployed on the chain, unless the author goes on there and uploads the, the corresponding code. Um, we can also say that most of these projects being open source and the um, the, the, those open source projects being available and the code being available, you can audit that code, but you have no real way of determining whether or not what was in the GitHub repo is actually what was deployed to the chain. So there are, to a degree, yes, you can see the, you know, the code that's there and it's all open. What's really open is the, the, tr the ledger, right? What was, what was the input and output of that of that particular transaction, but not necessarily 100% whether it's what the, the code that you're looking at is exactly what was uh, uploaded to the chain. But again, that also depends on which chain you're talking about. And these are some of the, the things that the questions that you're having, why new chains are developed? Well, you know, we can't see all the code. So, you know, we don't, maybe we go and that's a feature of this new chain. Um, the other things that are coming out are, are projects that are, you know, working through SDKs and ways to develop contracts that allow you to um, have a consistent way of developing these contracts rather than developing them from scratch. So uh, it's, it's semi-transparent from the code perspective, but for the most part, yeah, you can look at the code. So it, do, do look at the code, like if I write some code in Solidity, do I have to validate the input? that's coming inbound. Like when I, when, when someone asks me like, what's the, what's the root of the OWASP top 10 issues? Uh, it's, it's info validation. Like if you, if you could only solve one thing, if you could only have, take one mitigation from the OWASP top 10, for me, it'd be info validation all day long because I can, I can protect against so many other things, whether it's log injection, whether it's cross-site scripting, SQL injection, and any other injection. Is that, is that something I have to worry about in a smart contract where I first have to validate my input? And if I don't, then that could be the source of a, of a giant vulnerability in my contract? Absolutely. I mean, there are, one is if you're taking, if you're taking input into a contract, you should be validating it. You have similar protections around, you know, static typing or, um, or some sort of built-in validations in some of these languages, but you may not be able to cover all cases unless you, unless you understand your own business logic and, and validate what's expected. This is also the source of a lot of the ownership issues that we were talking about or the authorization issues between contracts because it wasn't validated against the owner of the contract. So when you deploy something um, in, depending on which chain you're talking about, you obviously don't want everyone to be able to execute administrative functions on the contract that you're deploying. You want to be able to control that in some way. Well, the only way that you control that on the blockchain is by um, 
verifying the private key, you know, the, the key relationship to the owner or the authorized party on that contract. So if you don't validate that and you just let everyone access these functions, you know, that authorization control isn't, isn't there. Um, comparing values is, is also similar. Um, the other thing that I, you know, sort of harp on in terms of like sending things back out into the world from the chain is that the outputs of these contracts eventually end up in the hands of uh, like a client side application. So all of your sort of um, browser based attacks are still valid as well inside of the smart contract because the output that you're generating um, eventually ends up on the on the client side. Well, in some cases. I'm realizing we could literally talk about this and I could ask you probably a hundred more questions and, and we still wouldn't uh, capture all of the, all of the intricacies of blockchain and security. So I want to ask a fo- one question before I get to your key takeaway, just to point our listeners in a direction, if they want to go look at some other resources and stuff like, what would you recommend? Are there any books or podcasts or blogs or sources of, of information that you would say, hey, for somebody who just wants to dive into this, the intersection of security and blockchain, where would you send them? Uh, so there, I'll, I'll give you some some links to maybe drop in the show. Uh, but there, there are a lot of resources on uh, Solidity. There's the Blockchain uh, Council. Um, YouTube is a is a, a great place to go for a lot of this stuff. Um, the you know on the on my side from just like the 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 Kadelsky Security blog has some things around blockchain uh, there that you can you can read. Um, as far as books. I would definitely, if you're looking at some of the low-level languages, you know, read up on on Rust and uh, and 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 Python and things of that nature. Definitely JavaScript for like WebJ3. Uh, there is a uh, a great um, collaboration uh, on just blockchain and cryptocurrency and security from Securium that I'll send you as well. It's just a list of videos. They did a great job putting a bunch of educational material together. Um, if you're just looking to you know dive straight in, but I'll definitely give you a whole bunch of lists. We need more people in the space. So I'm happy to, to point everyone in the right direction. Yeah, very cool. So what would be your key takeaway then? You know, as we as we wrap up our conversation, when you're thinking about, you know, what's the call to action for our listeners here? What do you want them to go do as a result of our conversation today? I I don't want folks to be afraid of security and blockchain. You know, if you think if you're listening to this podcast, there is something that you can contribute to blockchain security, whether that's architecture reviews or um, just being involved in the conversation or thinking through business logic flaws or whatever it may be. I think that the biggest takeaway is that uh, blockchain is not a silo that um, you can definitely 100% be involved in blockchain security with your current application security skill set. Um, and in some cases, you may not need too much ramp up depending on what that engagement or conversation might be. Um, it's, it's not as, uh, I guess, unapproachable as I think the majority of security folks think it is. Well, Ken, thank you for taking the time to educate us and our listeners about blockchain security and AppSec and cloud and, you know, how all these things fit together. I know I took away a lot of different things and I literally have hundreds more questions. So we'll do a follow-up in a few months. We'll do another one of these because I want to, I want to ask more questions and, and learn more from you about this. So thank you for sharing your, your knowledge and experience with our audience. And I look forward to a future conversation in the coming months. Sounds good. No, I really appreciate you having me on. Um, I love talking about this stuff, so I'm always happy to to chat through it. Um, and I thanks for yeah bringing me on 